The dietary abuse was very, very horrid. He would feed us the, this duck, and I, at one point I asked Mom, Mom, why does this taste so icky? And she said, well, I don't know, just eat it. And I said, Mom, I've had duck before. This tastes really bad. And she said, well, because it's spoiled. And I found out later that Rama would be feeding us this duck that had been sitting in warm garages for months. And with no refrigeration. And it just, it was very spoiled, and many people would get a lot of food poisoning. Um, you feed us a lot of uncooked chicken with the blood still inside. Um, you would feed us, like, an example was apples. We would have to eat the whole apple, including the core, because it was a sin to throw any kind of food away at all. And if it had a worm in it, we had to eat the worm. Um, the hot sauce, he was from India, so he liked spicy food. So because he liked spicy food, we had to like spicy food. So he's constantly pushing it on us. Um, so he would always have us sit there and drink a bottle of Tabasco sauce with a loaf of bread for whatever. But he would sit there and force us to drink bottles of, of hot sauce. Um, he would use hot sauce as an ointment or as a supposed healing method. Uh, if, he, if we had a headache, he would put hot sauce on our head as like a, and then pray like you would do with oil, and it would run down into our eyes. And I remember I couldn't see for like hours sometimes or minutes at least uh, because the hot sauce was my eyes stinging. We would be forced to eat tons of food at a time. He would give us like two, one or two quarts worth of soup to have to put in our belly. It didn't matter how old, how big we were, how big our stomachs were. We had to eat every ounce of food he gave us. So if he gave us like a gallon's worth of food, we had to eat every bit of it. Plus, and then he would throw an extra loaf of bread on the side. At points, he would make us go for hours or even days without food. And at the same time, would be either... Spending all that time in worship, nonstop monotone worship, or we'd be, for, be uh, doing a lot of physical labor outside, which required a lot of energy. And by the end of the, the shift, the 24-hour shift or the 12-hour shift, uh, we would just be staying around because we were so weak from the lack of food and the lack of drinking. A lot of the physical labor was... We would, uh, we, at one point, they dug out a pond, um, a huge pond. We would have to move just mountains of dirt and rock with, um, with the shovels. I remember at one, one point, there weren't enough shovels to go around. And so we ended up, it was in winter, and we had to move this huge pile of dirt. And so we, we had to, since there weren't enough shovels, we were using our hands to pick up this frozen dirt and put it into the wheelbarrows. And I remember my hands would just be bleeding from the cold and from the rocks that were in the dirt cutting into our hands. Um, we, I carried steel beams, um, carried big uh, chunks of cement that were bigger than me or that weighed more than me. Um, at one point, we were moving railroad ties, and this little, one of the girls was, uh, she dropped it on her foot. And Rama said, oh, you don't need a doctor. You go over and sit with your mom for a while. And, it, and her foot was just black and blue and all swollen. Because she had done this, and it was Rama's property that she had dropped, I had to pay the price. Rama told several of them to pick up the railroad tie and put it on my back. And he said, Elina, you're going to be Jesus' daughter. You're going to be the Lord's daughter. And you're going to carry it like the Lord did, like a cross. And so they picked it up and put it on my back, and I had to carry it for like a quarter or a half of a mile down this muddy road on, all by myself. I was 13 years old. You can imagine a little 13-year-old carrying a railroad tie uh, by herself. Um, uh, we would have to work all day watering pine trees that were young. They were growing, and so we had to water them all day long. 
We weren't allowed to stop for any food or any water. Um, and this would be a good 12, 16 hour shift. And this was when I was like five years old, seven years old, 12 years old. Um, and we weren't allowed to go to the bathroom. Uh, so uh, a lot of the girls, the guys could go because they could go in the bath, uh, in the woods and go. The girls weren't allowed to go because if anybody saw them, they would be whipped or beaten. So we would end up wetting our pants and we'd end up walking around all day long with the urine in our, on our legs and stuff. And by the end of the day, the acid from it would be burning our skin so bad, it'd just be bright red. By the end of the day, we couldn't even walk around hardly because it'd just be burning so bad. And we weren't wearing pants, we were wearing skirts. So it was skin to skin contact. We would have to sit through anywhere from five to 12 hour long meetings all day long without being able to go to the bathroom. Um, so a lot of kids would wet their pants in the meetings uh, and, and of course be publicly humiliated and many times whipped, many times whipped for that. Uh, and, they'd, and they would be forced to sit there all day in the meeting in, in their wetness. Uh, the adults had to go through the same thing. Many adults ended up messing their pants. And they went through the same verbal and, and uh, public humiliation. Uh, you can imagine a 35-year-old father of four not being allowed to go to the bathroom and wetting his pants. You know, I can't imagine an adult out here nowadays wetting their pants. I mean, it's perfectly, it's, it's, it's inhumane. Rama wanted us to feel vulnerable. I can see it now from the mind control point of view. He used it as a control tactic uh, because these are our basic human functions. And now I realize he was just using it to control us. Um, and once he had us listening to him, it was just he, he needed any way he could to make us fear him. And if we made him angry, he would use that. He would say, since you made you were bad, you were sinning, you can't go to the bathroom. It was a form of punishment. Um, I mean, it was, you know, it's basically a form of punishment and a form of control. What were those 12-hour meetings like? What happened at them? Um, we would spend a good couple of hours worshiping ourselves. And basically, we were sitting... In the beginning, we would be sitting on these uh, larger than pebble rocks uh, with nothing between our, our, our legs and the rocks, nothing between our knees and the rocks. And we would be kneeling the whole meeting like they do um, sitting in Buddhist faction. No, not Buddhist. Because um, we weren't allowed to cross our legs even. We would be kneeling the whole meeting. Uh, and if we moved, that was one of the punishments. If you moved, if you uh, crossed your legs or sat in any other position, um, you would get whipped. Or if you were an adult, you got verbally assaulted. Uh, but we had to sit there a whole meeting in one position, not moving at all. Uh, we would worship, we would sing our songs for a good couple of hours. And then Ron would come down, we sing some more, a couple hours worth of singing with him. And then he would start to preach um, his version of the Bible, his definition, um, he would preach about political issues that were going on and what he thought of them, um, and pushing all that on us. He would be telling us what to believe in and how we should be running our lives. And then there would be a good, you know, anywhere from two hours to five hour session of going after members for all they were quote unquote doing wrong, um, for not listening to him, for not calling him for certain decisions, for doing things without his control. So there's an awful lot of that. There, uh, just a lot of verbally yelling in the meetings. And this would just go on for long periods of time. Sometimes he would sit there and lay out some rules, like tell us how we should put the toothpaste on the toothbrush. Uh, when to take a shower, um, when to go to the bathroom during the day, what's the best um, time to eat an apple, um, 
whether or not we could have pets. Uh, we weren't allowed to watch television. We weren't allowed to read newspapers. Uh, we weren't allowed to socialize with anybody in the outside world. Our world was very, very closed in, even though we didn't always, we would leave the compound. Our environment was very closed in. So he would, um, you know, sit there and anything that we found out about the outside world mostly came from him. And so, thus we came up with his perceptions of the outside world. And that's how we looked at everything. That's how we looked at life. Um, no music, no, no books, no parties, no proms, no graduations, no ceremonies, no birthdays, no holidays, um, absolutely no fun. It was all you had to be very serious. Um, he would throw in a joke or two, but you had to stop laughing before he did. If he caught you laughing at his jokes when you weren't, when he didn't want you to laugh, that guaranteed you another whipping. Um, it was very rarely you saw a smile on somebody's face. Did you go to regular schools? Um, the first couple of the first, in the beginning, most of us did go to a public school. I went for two years. Um, and then he decided to pull everybody out because it was being too, everybody was being too worldly. And he felt like he couldn't control people and what we were learning and what we were doing. So he sent everyone to homeschool. So we are all being taught by our mothers at home. And um, none of them were really qualified to be teachers or anything. We got lucky though, we did use textbooks from the public schools. So it was pretty, it was a pretty, actually I had a pretty good education. The last two years of my high school, um, we did go back to public school. But the same thing with the first two years, we weren't allowed to be social at all with anybody outside the group when we went to the school. We had to take very formal, we had to take the basic classes, math, history, English, and science. We weren't allowed to take art. We weren't allowed to take gym, um, which is fine. You know, some religions allow that. I mean, don't allow that. It was part of our religious theology. Um, but just we were very much cut off from other people. We would go to school and go to our classes, but we weren't allowed to talk to the other kids in the classroom that were next to us. Um, and they would try, someone would try to talk to us, but we wouldn't reciprocate. When did you leave this group? I left in March of 1996. And have you talked to your parents at all since then? Yes, I, I, um, my, we all left. My whole family left at the same time. Um, Actually, my mom left in January, and me and my dad, eventually, we left in March. Well, what led to you leaving the group, and how did you do that? Um, it was a number of factors. Number one, my mom has kind of stopped going because she just... We were all getting very sick of the verbal abuse that was going on. We couldn't handle it. We were watching it happen to others, and we were watching it happen to ourselves, and we couldn't take it anymore. And at some point, we made sort of, sort of a consensus uh, that we didn't want to sit there and listen to it anymore. Another reason is because we were dirt poor. We couldn't even go to the bank and get $5 out for gas. Um, but your family was working. Where did the money go? My dad was not... They weren't working. They weren't? No. Because Rama had told them, well, my mom, at some point, Rama was pushing education, so they both were going to school at the time. And I think they were working, but they were doing temp jobs. So whatever money they came up with, though, since we were on welfare, whatever money they came up with went directly towards Rama. If you weren't on welfare, you saved, you spent money on beans and bread and gas money to go to Ramas. Those are the necessities in our life. Um, and so, um, so that was the main reason, one of the, the two main reasons. And then I had my own personal reasons. I did not want to be in arranged marriage. I was so scared that Rama was going to arrange a marriage between me and somebody. 
I did not want to go through that. How old were you at that? Seventeen. Um, that was not the normal age, but I knew that as the years went on, like in my early 20s, that might have happened. And I did not want to fall in the same trap that my parents had fallen into. Uh, right after we left the group, they got a divorce. They were not compatible at all. They did not get along at all. And so I did not want to fall in that same trap. And so that was, that for me personally, that and the verbal assault was the two main reasons why I left. And it basically it was a walk away. We just, because we, because we didn't have that money to go that weekend, we didn't go. And at first we called Rama and asked for permission. Rama said, yes, you don't have to come because we were so broke. The next weekend we thought about going and that's when we really, we kind of, we got, we discussed the verbal assaults and how we were very tired of hearing them and, and physically we were tired of traveling every weekend, five hours there, five hours back and getting only an hour or two of sleep on the weekends and all the physical labor. So we're very physically exhausted. My dad's back was going out on him. And so we just, the next weekend we said, well, do we go on a go? And we said, no. So we just stopped going. Were there any repercussions from not going? My mom had several, Rama would call her just about every weekend for a while and try and t tell her to come back. I don't know if she got verbally assaulted on the phone by him or not, but I know she had some real strong pressure from him and from us as a family, because she stopped going two months before us. Once me and Dad stopped going, we had a couple of phone calls and that was it. That was all the pressure we got. So we got lucky. Um, several of the members that did quit going got a lot more than that. Some of them got uh, people stopping by their houses. Um, but there was no real threat. It was more in the conscience, in the mind. Because we had been told that if we left, that was it. Once we knew that salvation existed and we didn't take advantage of that, we would be gone forever. We would have lost it forever. And there's no coming back that would have guaranteed us a place in heaven. Once we left, we were damned to hell. And so... We were walking around uh, with our own punishment, our own mind telling us that um, it was our own doing, it was our own sin, and that it had nothing to do with Rama whatsoever. And um, the repercussions were from ourselves. How's your life today? Um, it has its pluses and minuses. I have a pretty good social life. I go out and karaoke. Um, I regress to my childhood. I get coloring books. I love to color now. Um, I read lots of, lots and lots of books. Uh, getting to know the life that existed outside of mine. Getting to know this whole new world. Um, I spent the last five years learning stuff that you learn, that you should learn that in your, that in your childhood. Things that you should have known, how to interact with people, how to make major decisions. I have the toughest time making major decisions. At this point, I don't have a job uh, because I can't function at work right now because my past just keeps flying back at me. I am now living outside of the home, but I'm living with friends because I, ha I cannot find a place of my own both financially and mentally. It's, I, it's very hard for me to take that one single step and then to take the next step. I almost have to have somebody physically take me out and do all this for me because I can't do it for myself. Um, What's your relationship with your parents like now? Um, it's actually very positive now. The first few years, it was difficult because we were dealing with a lot of pain um, and anger towards my parents and what they put me through, um, trying to understand what was happening and where I was in this life, where I was going. They were going through a lot of emotional pain of years that they had lost. And so there was a lot of anger, um, especially between me and my dad, because more of it came from him. And so I was trying to make him deal with it. I was trying to face him and, and tell him to apologize and, and so we had a hard time. But nowadays, 
I've a, we've talked through a lot, and I'm, I'm on a very friendly relationship basis, basis with them. Uh, we get along very well. They're like my best friends now. So, and we're emotionally we're pretty close. Physically, we're we're there too. I can now give my dad a hug. I can give my mom a hug. It still feels very uncomfortable because that whole physical intimacy is very alien to me still. Emotional intimacy is alien to me. Spiritual intimacy is alien to me. And so I still have a hard time, but I've just been forcing, I've had to force myself. And they've had to force themselves. They're not used to hugging their children. Uh, so they've actually been taking opportunities when they can and do it. And it's been very good for all of us. The place that kind of just literally saved my life was Wellspring. They gave me a reason to live. They told me that I am a unique person and that I'm a, I am my own person and that I don't need to contemplate suicide anymore um, and that I, am, I have my own talents and abilities. I am no less than anybody, anybody else on earth. I'm no less than anybody. And uh, so they helped me see that I am a good person and that... Uh, that it was not right, it was not normal for me to go through this. The other point I want to make is that um, this is starting to become a new issue. A lot of people are now realizing that there has been a lot of abuse going on that they did not know of. And it's all because people like me who are born and raised are now coming out and telling these horror stories. And I really think... I am biased on this, but I think that's one of the hottest topics today, and not just with cults, but in our general human society, that we, as human beings and as adults, have a responsibility to look at and to discover and to take care of the fact that all this child abuse is happening and there's nothing being done about it. And it's one of the points that I'm really going to be stressing um, as, uh, I keep, as I go on with my life and I'm going to be working with other people about it. It's, it's very much a closed in world and a lot of people don't know about it. And if they do, they are choosing to close their minds off about it. And it's a very serious issue. The dietary abuse was very, very horrid. He would feed us the, this duck, and I, at one point I asked Mom, Mom, why does this taste so icky? And she said, well, I don't know, we'll just eat it. And I said, Mom, I've had duck before. This tastes really bad. And she said, well, because it's spoiled. And I found out later that Rama would be feeding us this duck that had been sitting in warm garages for months and with no refrigeration. And it just, it was very spoiled, and many people would get a lot of food poisoning. Um, he would feed us a lot of uncooked chicken with the blood still inside. Um, he would feed us, like, an example was apples. We would have to eat the whole apple, including fired a lot of energy. And by the end of the, the shift, the 24-hour shift or the 12-hour shift, uh, we would just be staying around because we were so weak from the lack of food and the lack of drinking. A lot of the physical labor was, we would, uh, we, at one point they dug out a pond, um, a huge pond. We would have to move just mountains of dirt and rock with, um, with the shovels. I remember at one, t one point there weren't enough shovels to go around. And so... We ended up, it was in winter, and we had to move this huge pile of dirt. And so we had to, since there weren't enough shovels, we were using our hands to pick up this frozen dirt and put it into the wheelbarrows. And I remember my hands would just be bleeding from the cold and from the rocks that were in the dirt cutting into our hands. Um, we, I carried steel beams. Um carry big uh, chunks of cement that were bigger than me or that weighed more than me. Um, at one point, we were moving railroad ties, and this little one of the girls 
was uh, she dropped it on her foot. And Rama said, oh, you don't need a doctor. You go over and sit with your mom for a while. And, it, and her foot was just black and blue and all swollen. Because she had done this, and it was Rama's property that she had dropped, I had to pay the price. Rama told several of them to pick up the railroad tie and put it on oil, and it would run down into our eyes. And I remember I couldn't see for like hours sometimes, or minutes at least, uh, because the hot, so hot sauce was my eyes stinging. We would be forced to eat tons of food at a time. He would give us like two, one or two quarts worth of soup to have to put in our belly. It didn't matter how old, how big we were, how big our stomachs were. We had to eat every ounce of food he gave us. So if he gave us like a gallon's worth of food, we had to eat every bit of it. Plus, and then he would throw an extra loaf of bread on the side. At points, he would make us go for hours or even days without food. And at the same time, would be either spending all that time in worship, nonstop monotone worship, or we'd be, for, be uh, doing a lot of physical labor outside, which required the core, because it was a sin to throw any kind of food away at all. And if it had a worm in it, we had to eat the worm. Um, the hot sauce, he was from India. So he likes spicy food. So because he likes spicy food, we had to like spicy food. So he's constantly pushing it on us. Um, so he would always have us sit there and drink a bottle of Tabasco sauce with a loaf of bread for whatever. But he would sit there and force us to drink bottles of, of hot sauce. Um, he would use hot sauce as an ointment or as a supposed healing method. Uh, if he, if we had a headache, he would put hot sauce on our head as like a, and then pray like you would do with 